Muslim brothers and guests. As my brother mentioned to you, uh, I am here tonight and feeling very honored to have this opportunity to address you on this topic. And I want to say that this is not a lecture. Uh, I don't think that I'm prepared to lecture. But it's sort of um, an advice to myself even, because I see myself sitting in these chairs in front of me. Just a few days ago, a few years ago, just a little while ago, I was sitting right there where you are, Christian, non-Muslim, whatever nationality, doesn't matter. A human being that was not aware of Islam and at that particular time did not really understand the purpose of life. So with that note, I would request you to think of what I'm saying to you just as information and as advice, not a lecture. The information which I wish to share with you, it may seem a bit extensive, but when you consider the human brain and the amount of information, when you consider the capacity of the human brain and the amount of information that it can store, and that it can decipher. In a few pages of information tonight, I'm sure it will not overburden you. It is my responsibility to address the topics of our discussion tonight. What is the purpose of our life? And also ask the question, what do you know about Islam? I mean, what do you really know about Islam? Not what you heard about Islam, not what you've seen in the action of some Muslims, but what do you know about Islam? I am honored to have this opportunity, and I would like to begin by saying that all of you have an equal responsibility, and that responsibility is to listen with an open heart and an open mind. In a world filled with prejudice and cultural conditioning, it is very hard to find people that are able to take a moment to think, to think about life objectively and try to arrive at the truth about this world and the real purpose of our lives. Unfortunately, when you ask most people the question, what is the purpose of our life? Such a fundamental and important question. They will not tell you what they have concluded through observation or analytical reasoning. Rather, in most cases, they will simply tell you what someone else said. Or they will tell you what is commonly presumed by others. What my father said the purpose of life is. What the minister of my church said the purpose of life is. What my teacher in school said. What my friend said. If I ask anyone about the purpose of eating, you see, why do we eat? Everyone will say, in more one word or another, why it's for nutrition because nutrition sustains life. If I ask anyone why they work, they will say, because it's a necessity in order to support themselves and to provide the needs of their family. If I ask anyone why they sleep, why they wash, why they dress, etc., they will answer, this is a common necessity for all human beings. We can follow this line of questioning with a hundred questions and receive the same or similar answers from anyone in any language in any place in the world. Simple. 
when I ask you the question, why is it that when we ask the question, what is the goal and the purpose of life, that we get so many different answers? That's because people are confused. They don't really know. They're stumbling in the dark. And rather than to say, I don't know, they just offer any answer that they've been programmed to answer. Well, think about it tonight. Is our purpose in this world simply to eat, sleep, dress, work, acquire some material things and enjoy ourselves? Is this our purpose? Why are we born? What is the object of our existence? And what is the wisdom behind the creation of man and this tremendous universe? Think about that question. Some persons argue that there's no proof of any divine origin. There's no proof that there's a God. There's no proof that this universe has come about through any divine purpose. There are people who argue this way. And they say that perhaps this world came about by chance. A big bang and this whole great world with all its orchestration just came together. And they argue that life doesn't have any definite purpose and that there's nothing that can be proven through either logic or science that there's a God or a purpose or any divine reason behind this world. Here I would like to mention a few verses from the Quran that addresses this subject and I'd like you to listen first to the Arabic because the Arabic is a medicine. While you're listening, you're getting the medicine. And after that, I'll offer the transliteration. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء قدير إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار we seek the protection of Allah from every evil thing. Allah mentions to us in the Quran that to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and Allah has power over everything. Behold, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alternation of the night and the day, there are indeed signs for men of understanding. Men who celebrate the praises of Allah, standing, sitting, and lying down on their side, and they contemplate the wonders of the creation in the heavens and the earth with the thought, our Lord, not for any foolish purpose, has thou created all of this? Glory be to thee. Give us salvation from the penalty of the hellfire. Now here in these verses, Allah has mentioned very clearly to us by first drawing our attention to the creation of ourselves, the different postures of the human body, the different attitudes of the human psychology. He draws our attention to the heavens. The alternation of the night and the day. The firmament 
the stars, the constellations. And then he says to us, he has not created all of this for any foolish purpose. Because when you see the design of it, you know that the design of it is very powerful and very precise. And something very powerful and very precise that is beyond your own calculation and imagination, it cannot be foolish. It cannot be just thrown together. For instance, if you took 10 marbles and numbered them 1 to 10, and all of them were different colors, and you put them inside of a bag and shook the bag, and then closing your eyes, reached inside that bag, and I told you, pull out marble number one, and then pull out marble number two, and then pull out marble number three, in order. What's the chance of your pulling out those 10 marbles in order? Do you know what the chances are? 26 million to one. So what's the chances of the heavens and the earth being thrown in a big bang and orchestrated like they are? What's the chance of that? My dear respected brothers, we have to ask ourselves a further question. When you see a bridge, a building, or an automobile, you automatically consider the person or the company that constructed it. When you see an airplane, a rocket, a satellite, or a large ship, you also think about how incredible of a vehicle that it is. When you see a nuclear plant, an orbiting space station, a super international airport like what exists here in this country, you have to be thoroughly impressed with the engineering dynamics that are involved. Yet, these are just things that are manufactured by humans, manufactured by human beings. Then what about the human body? With its massive and intricate control systems. Think about it. Think about the brain. How it thinks, how it functions, how it analyzes, stores information, retrieves information, distinguishes and categorizes information in a millionth of a second and does it constantly. Think about the brain for a moment. This is the brain that made the automobile, the rocket ships, the boats and so and so. Think about the brain who made that. Think about the heart how it pumps continuously for 60 or 70 years, intaking and discharging blood throughout the body and maintaining that steady precision throughout the life of that person. Think about it. Think about the kidneys, what kind of function that they carry. The purifying instrument of the body, which performs hundreds of chemical analyses simultaneously and also controls the level of toxicity in the content of the body. And it does this automatically. Think about your eyes, the human camera, that adjusts, focus, interprets, evaluates, applies color automatically, the natural reception and adjustment to light and distance. Automatic. Think about it. Who created that? Who has mastered that? Who plans that? And who regulates that? Human beings themselves? No, of course not. What about this universe? Think about this. This Earth is one planet in our solar system. And our solar system is one of the systems in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is one of the constellations in, this, in that galaxy. And there are millions of galaxies like the Milky Way. Think about that. And they are all in order. They are all precise. They are not colliding with each other. They are not conflicting with each other. And they are swimming along in an orbit that has been set for them. Has human beings set that into motion? And are human beings maintaining that precision? No, of course they're not. Think about the oceans, the fish, 
the insects, the birds, the plants, bacteria, the chemical elements that have not been discovered and cannot be detected even with the most sophisticated instruments. Yet each one of them has a law that they follow. Did all of this synchronization, balance, harmony, variation, design, maintenance, operation, and infinite numeration, did this happen by chance? And also, do these things function perpetually and perfectly also by chance? And do they keep on reproducing themselves and maintaining themselves also by chance? No, of course not. That would be totally illogical and foolish to think. And in the least, it would indicate that however it came to be, it is totally outside of the realm of human capabilities. We would all agree to that. The being, the almighty power, God, the creator who has the knowledge to design, to proportion, who has created all of this and is responsible for maintaining all of this is the only one that is deserving of praise and gratitude. If I gave each one of you a hundred dollars for no reason just for coming here, you would at least say thank you. What about your eyes, your kidneys, your brain, your life, your breath, your children? What about that? Who gave you that? Is he not worthy of praise and thanks? Is he not worthy of your worship and your recognition? My brothers, that in a nutshell is the purpose and the goal of this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us in the Quran, I have not created the jinn the spirits, nor the human beings for any other purpose except to worship me. This is what the Almighty said. So our purpose in this life is to recognize the Creator, to be grateful to the Creator, to worship the Creator, to surrender ourselves to the Creator, and to obey the laws that He has determined for us. In a nutshell, it means worship. This is our purpose on this life. And whatever we do in the course of that worship, that system, the eating, the drinking, the dressing, the working, the enjoying between the life and the death, all of this is just consequential, but we have been created for worship. That's the purpose of our life. I don't think that anyone who is scientific or analytical they won't have much argument with that purpose. They may have some other ulterior purpose within themselves, but that's something they have to deal with between themselves and Almighty God. Let's go to the second half of our topic. What do you know about Islam? Not what you heard about Islam, not what you have seen in the action of Muslims, because there's a difference between Islam and Muslims. There's a difference between a man and a father. A man who has children. He is a father, but father is a responsibility. If a man does not fulfill those responsibilities, he is not, he is not necessarily a good father. Islam is a rule and an order. If a Muslim does not fulfill these rules and orders, he is not a good Muslim. So you cannot compare Islam by Muslims. We hear the terms Islam and Muslims quite often. And we read about Islam and Muslims in the periodicals, textbooks of colleges and universities. We hear and we see a lot of inaccurate, misleading, and purposeful misinformation through the media. 
And I have to admit that some of this misinformation and misrepresentation has been perpetuated by Muslims themselves. Yet, one out of every five persons in this world, of some five billion people, is a Muslim. One out of five people in this world is a Muslim. This is a statistic that you can verify in the encyclopedia or the almanac or any other sources that you like to look at. How is it that if one out of five people in this world is a Muslim, that we don't know something about Islam, the facts about Islam? If I told you that one out of five people in this world was Chinese, which is a fact, there's one billion Chinese in the world, one out of five people is Chinese. But we know the geographical, the social, the economical, the political, the philosophical, the historical factors about China and the Chinese. How come we don't know about Islam? What is it that joins 29 nations and some say 37 nations. What is it that joins these nations and this universal configuration into a common fraternity? What makes a brother in Saudi Arabia my brother and I'm from America and makes this brother from Pakistan my brother and makes another brother from Indonesia my brother and from Africa my brother and another one from Thailand my brother and from China and from Spain and from Russia and so forth. What makes them my brother? We have that different cultural, psychological backgrounds. What is it about Islam that automatically embraces us and joins us together as a brotherhood? What are the accurate characteristics of this misunderstood way of life that is followed by the great part of humanity? I will try to provide you with some facts, but in addition to this, as I mentioned to you before, it is necessary for you to be open-minded and open-hearted because if I turned the glass upside down and poured water on it, I'll never get a glass of water. It has to be right side up. Facts alone do not lead to understanding, but rather a combination of tolerance, ambition, and the ability to appreciate and accept the truth when you hear it. The word Islam means surrender, submission, and obedience. Surrender, submission, and obedience to the law of Almighty God. You can say Allah, you can say the Creator, you can say the supreme God, the supreme force, the all-wise, all of those are his names. We say Allah because in Arabic there's no other expression. This expression Allah cannot be applied to any created thing. Other words that we use for Almighty, people apply to created things. The almighty dollar. Oh, I love my wife. She is tops. Oh, and he's the greatest. No, 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 no. But the word Allah can only be applied to the one who has created all of this that we have previously described. So from this point, I'm going to use the word Allah, and you know whom I'm speaking about. The word Islam is derived from the root salama. It means to be at peace or to have security. Therefore, a Muslim is a person that surrenders, submits, and obeys to the law of Almighty God, and through this submission obtains peace and security for themselves. We can immediately see that by such a definition, the Arabic word Islam describes the same manner and behavior of all the well-known and respected prophets and messengers of Almighty God. All of them. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Isaac, Ismail, Jacob, John the Baptist, Suleiman, Jesus, the son of Mary, and Muhammad. May Allah's peace be upon him and all of them. 
all of these men, these prophets and messengers, came from the same Almighty God with the same message, with the same chain of transmission, and they said one thing, obey God, worship Almighty God and fulfill the purpose of life, and do good actions and you will be rewarded with another life. That's all they said. Don't make it more than that. That's all they said, regardless of what language and what time, whom they came to. That's all they said. If you read the scriptures carefully, without your own interpretation or somebody else's addition or fabrication, you will find that this was the simple message of all those prophets who confirmed one another. Not one of those prophets ever said, I am God, worship me. You don't have to think because you won't find it in any book that you have. Not the Bible, not the Torah, not the Old or the New Testament, not the Psalms of David. You will not find it in any book. You will not find it from the speech of any prophet. Go home tonight and palm through all the pages of your Bible and I guarantee you, you will not find it once, anywhere. So where did this come from? That's something else that you have to investigate. And in another setting, we can set that straight very easily for you. History has a way of turning over every stone. We can immediately see that by such a definition, the Arabic word describes what all the prophets did. They all came and submitted themselves to God, surrendered themselves to God, called the people to God, and asked the people and insisted upon the people to do deeds of righteousness. The Ten Commandments of Moses, what was that? The speech of Abraham, what was that? The Psalms of David, what was that? The Proverbs of Solomon, what did he say? The Gospel of Jesus Christ, what did he say? What did John the Baptist say? What did Isaac and Ismail say? What did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa peace be upon him, what did he say? Nothing more than that. وَمَا أُمِنُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَحُدِّينَ Allah said. And they were all at nothing except to worship Allah, being sincere towards Him. وَذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمَةِ And this was the straight way. This was the original message. By the same token, it would also be appropriate here to consider those prophets and messengers as Muslims, because Muslim is what? Don't think about the Arabic terminology. Don't think about how we address. Don't think about Mecca or Saudi Arabia or Egypt. But no, think about the word Muslim means he who surrenders himself to Almighty God and obeys the laws of Almighty God. In that case, whether naturally or, or in a dialectical manner, everything that surrenders to the law of Almighty God is a Muslim. So when a child comes out of the womb of its mother at the time that God is ordered, what is it? It's a Muslim. When the son goes around in its orbit. What is it? It's a Muslim. When the moon goes around the sun, what is it? It's a Muslim. The law of gravity, what is it? It's a Muslim law. Everything that submits to Almighty God is a Muslim. Therefore, when we willfully obey Almighty God, we are Muslims. Jesus Christ was a Muslim. His mother, his blessed mother was a Muslim. Abraham was a Muslim. Moses was a Muslim. All the prophets were Muslims. But they came to their people and they spoke different languages. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, spoke the language of Arabic. And so in the Arabic language, submit and surrender is Muslim. The one who submits and surrenders is Muslim. Every Prophet and Messenger of Almighty God brought the very same and fundamental message. Worship Almighty God and be sincere towards Him. If we examine the message of each of the well-known prophets, we can easily conclude this fact. Where there is a conflict, it is a result of false, false assertions, fabrications, exaggerations, personalized interpretations of alleged writers, historians, scholars, and individuals. Let me point something out for you that maybe you haven't looked at. As a Christian, I looked at it before I became a Muslim and I didn't understand it. 
how come throughout the Old Testament, God is always referred to as one, the master and lord and king of the universe, and that in the first commandment given to Moses, he did not allow anybody to worship any graven images or to bow down to anything in the heavens or the earth or the sea below. He never allowed that. All the prophets said he was one, that he was the almighty God. Throughout the Old Testament, this is com completely repeated in every place. Then all of a sudden, we got four testimonies. The four Gospels called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew who? Mark who? Luke who? John who? Four different Gospels that were written 48 years apart, and none of these men who did not collaborate with each other, none of them wrote their last name. If I gave you a check for your pay this month, and I wrote my first name on the check and told you to take it to the bank. Would you accept that check? No, you wouldn't. If the policeman stopped you with your ikama and you only had your first name, is that acceptable to him? Could you get a passport with your first name? Did your mother and father only give you one name? Where in the history of man is one name accepted as a documentation? Where? Nowhere, except in the Bible. And how could you base your faith upon four Gospels that are written by four men that didn't seem to know their last names. Then after those four Gospels, there are 15 more books written by a man who was an apostate, who killed Christians, tortured Christians, and then said that he, in a vision, saw Jesus, and he was commissioned as an apostle of Jesus. If I told you that Hitler, after he killed all the Jews, then he himself decided that he wanted to be saved and he met Christ or Moses on the path and he became a Jew and he wrote 15 books and added them to the Torah. Would this be acceptable to the Jews? No, you wouldn't accept that. So how can four books without a last name and 15 other books written by another man and this is the first time that God is called a man and the first time that God is called three and the first time God is given a son how is this acceptable to Christians? How? Think about it. We won't argue that point. I'll just give you something to think about. The advent of the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace be upon him, did not bring a new religion or a way of life as some people erroneously claim. On the contrary, the Prophet, may Allah's peace be upon him, confirmed the life and message of all the previous prophets and messengers, both through his personal conduct and through the divine revelation that he received from the Almighty. The sacred scripture that Muhammad, may Allah peace be upon him, brought is called Al-Qur'an. This is what you heard, Al-Qur'an. It means that which is recited. Because Muhammad, may Allah peace be upon him, he did not write the Qur'an. He did not offer the Qur'an. Nobody came and helped him to write the Qur'an or to author the Quran and nobody collaborated with him in this. But the angel Gabriel recited to him and Almighty God made his heart a receptacle of that. Just like the satellite disk is a receptive of waves and gives you the TV image. The Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace be upon him's heart was a receptacle of revelation and we have this Quran that has been preserved for 15 years without the change of a dot. Is there any other book in the world that you know of that has been preserved as it was revealed without the changing even of a dot? No book. Only the Quran. Don't take my word for it. Go to the library and read what the Encyclopedia Britannica or the World Encyclopedia or the Americanas Encyclopedia or any other universal encyclopedia of the world that is not written by Muslims, read what it says about Islam, the Quran, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Read what non-Muslims said about the Quran, Islam, and Muhammad, peace be upon him. Then you will accept that what I'm saying is universally documented and clear. That Muhammad, may Allah's peace be upon him, is the most profound individual in the history of humanity. Profound why? Read what they say. 
that the Quran is the most incredible, the most profound piece of literature in the annals of history. Read what they say. That the Islamic way of life is categorized and so precise and dynamic, it has never changed. Read what they say. The sacred scripture that Muhammad وسلم, received is called the Quran. And each of the prophets and messengers, they also received a scripture. And in the Quran, these prophets, their scripture, their story, the principle of their mission is mentioned with profound detail. Did Muhammad, may Allah's peace upon him, did he meet them and eat with them and talk with them and collaborate with them to write their biographies? No, of course he didn't. In the Quran, Muhammad وسلم, is referred to as the messenger of Almighty God and the seal of the previous prophets, which is the limit of his role as a human being. Muslims do not worship Muhammad. We are not Muhammadans. We have not the right to take the name of Muhammad and say we are Muhammadans. Nor were the people who followed Moses, they were not Moseans. The people who followed Jacob were not Jacobites. Or the people who followed Abraham were not Abrahamians. Or Davidians. No, no, no. So how do people call themselves Christians? Christ did not call himself a Christian. How do people call themselves Christians? Christ said that whatever he received from Almighty God was the order of God. And what he heard, this is what he said. This is what he did. So how do we call ourselves Christians? We have to be Christ-like. And what was Christ like? He was a servant of Almighty God, so you should be servants of Almighty God. That's all. As a final scripture and divine revelation, the Quran makes the very clear and concise statement, this day have I perfected your religion and completed my favor upon you, and chosen Islam as a complete way of life. So through the Quran, the word Islam came. As a word, Islam, it came in the Quran, because when the building is complete, you call it a house. When the car is on the assembly line, it is not an automobile. It is in the process of assembly. When it has been completed, it has been certified, it has been test driven, it is now an automobile. When Islam was completed as a revelation, as a book, as an example through the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, it then became Islam. It became a complete way of life, Deen al-Islam. So it is the word that was new, but not the practice, not the prophet, not the order from God, not a new God, not a new revelation, but only the name, Islam. And as we said previously, what were all the prophets? They were all Muslims. Another distinction to keep in mind is that Muhammad, peace be upon him, unlike his predecessors, he did not come to the Arabs or to his own people exclusively. No. Therefore, Islam is not a religion of the Arabs. It is not for the Arabs. Yes, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, peace be upon him, he was born in Mecca, a city in the Arabian Peninsula, and certainly he was an Arab by birth. Consequences of his birth, choice of the Almighty. Additionally, the Quran was revealed in the Arabic language to protect it, to make it pure and clear and precise. Yet the Quran dispels any inclinations or assertions that the message of Muhammad was limited or meant for the Arabics, Arabs exclusively. Allah has said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرٌ وَنَذِيرٌ وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ that you have not been sent, O Muhammad, may Allah's peace be upon you, except as, except to the whole of humanity as a warner, as the one giving, bringing glad tidings. And most of the human beings, they simply don't know. As such, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the finality and crown of the great prophets and messengers before him. And since we are making reference to the Qur'an to support our presentation, we should give some background information on the Qur'an itself. First of all, the Qur'an makes the claim that it is the product of divine revelation. That is, it was sent down from the Almighty God to Muhammad through inspiration. Allah said, 
وما ينطق عن الحوى إن هو إلا وحي يوها that Muhammad he is not speaking from himself his own ideas or his own ambition or his own emotion and feelings no but this is a revelation the Quran which is being revealed to him this is a statement of Allah therefore if we are to convince you or anyone else of the authenticity of the Quran, we must prove, one, that it was impossible for Muhammad to manufacture such a book, peace be upon him. Secondly, we must prove that it was equally impossible for any human agency to have created it. Let us think about this. I ask you, the Quran makes the statement And we created the human beings from a hanging plot that was clinging to the wall of the womb. How did the Prophet Muhammad, how did he know that the embryo started out as a clot hanging and clinging to the wall of the uterus of the mother? Did he have a telescope? Did he have a cystoscope? Did he have some kind of x-ray vision? How did he receive this knowledge when it was just discovered 47 years ago? How did he know that the oceans have a barrier between them to separate the salt and the fresh water? How did he know that? How did he know? How did he know that the sun and the moon and the planets are all swimming in an orbit that have been ordered for them? How did he know that? And on and on and on. How did he know that? When these things have just been discovered 25 or 30 years ago technology and science the sophistication of which you and I well know have just discovered these things how did Muhammad peace be upon him 1500 years ago an uneducated shepherd a man raised in the desert a man who was uneducated could not read or write how could he say something like this how could he produce something like this and how could anyone else living with him before or after produce something that has just been discovered recently? Impossible. How could a man who never left the Arabian Peninsula, a man who never sailed on a ship, who lived 15 centuries ago, make such clear and astounding descriptions that were recently discovered in this half of the 20th century? Also, if this is not enough, let me mention to you that the Quran has 114 chapters, over 6,000 verses, and there were hundreds of people in the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who memorized this book entirely. Was he some kind of genius? How did that happen? There are millions of Muslims today, here's one sitting here, who has memorized this entire book. This is the ambition of every Muslim, not some, every. How many Christians have you ever met in your life that has memorized the Bible? None. You've never met any Christian that memorized the whole Bible because you've never met a Christian who even knew what was the whole Bible. Because the Christians themselves have over 700 different denominations and there are approximately 39 different versions of the Bible with different books and different versions different amounts of verses and different amounts of chapters and they don't agree to that so how could they even memorize what they don't agree about this is just some facts about the Quran and I'm not speaking in a condemning fashion I'm a person who was a Christian a person who found out these things through my own investigation a person who is now sharing this information for you overturning some rocks for you to look under and it's up to you Finally, suppose I told you that this book has been universally preserved without the slightest alteration of any kind in 15 centuries. If all of this is true, what I'm saying, if it is all true, would you agree that this book is quite profound and unique to say the least? 
Would you be honest enough to say that? Of course you would, if you were honest. And you are. Within yourselves, you have to come to that conclusion. Many other non-Muslims came to the same conclusion. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Napoleon Bonaparte, Winston Churchill, many, many, I could go on and on and on. They came to the same conclusion. Whether they accepted Islam openly or not, they came to that conclusion that there's no other literature in the world that is as profound as the Quran as a source of wisdom and healing and direction. Now that we have settled the issue of the authenticity of the Quran, let us turn to another subject matter. The basic themes of the Quran. The supreme oneness of Almighty God, which includes his names, the attributes, the relationship between the Almighty and his creatures, and how man should maintain that relationship. The continuity of prophets and messengers, their lives, their messages, and their overall mission. The insistence upon following the final and universal example, Muhammad, the peace and blessings be upon him, the seal of the prophets and messengers. Reminding the human beings of the shortness of this life and calling them towards the eternity of this life. Calling them towards the eternity of the life hereafter. Life hereafter, meaning after here. You know, after you leave here, you're going somewhere. I mean, tonight. But after you die and you leave here, this earth, you're going somewhere, whether you accept it or know about it, you're going there and you are responsible because you have been told, even if you have rejected it. Because the object of this life is... I mean tonight. Well, after you die and you leave here, this earth, you're going somewhere, whether you accept it or know about it, you're going there and you are responsible because you have been told, even if you have rejected it. Because the object of this life is not for you to sit here and after this do nothing and have no effect. Every cause has an effect. And you came into this life for a cause and a purpose, and it must have an effect. It must want some sort of effect. You don't go to school to stay there. You don't go to work not to get paid. You don't build a house and don't move into it. You don't get a suit made and don't wear it. You don't grow up as a child and don't become an adult. You don't work without expecting a reward. You cannot live without expecting to die. You cannot die without the, ex without the expectancy of the grave. And you cannot expect that the grave is the end. Because that would mean that God has created you for a foolish purpose. And you have not went to school or uh, worked or done anything or chose a wife or chose the name of your children or came here tonight for a foolish purpose, how could you assign to God something less than yourselves? In an attempt to capture and convince the imagination and faculties of reasoning, the Quran goes through great length and beauty to expound upon the oceans and rivers, the trees and plants, the birds and insects, the wild and domestic animals, the mountains, the valleys, the expansion of the heavens, the celestial bodies and the universe, the fishes and the aquatic life, the human anatomy and biology, the human civilization and history, the description of paradise and hell, the evolution of the human embryo, the mission of all the prophets and messengers, the purpose of life on earth. And how could a man born in a desert, a man that's illiterate and couldn't read, how could a man born in the desert and could not read and watching sheep, how could he expound upon things that he was never exposed to? The most 
unique aspect of the Quran, however, is that it serves to confirm all the previous revealed scriptures. And that if you should decide to become a Muslim, you do not have to consider yourself changing your religion. You are not changing your religion. If you gained weight and you had a suit and you really liked that suit, you don't have to throw the suit away, do you? No. Go to the tailor and tell him, listen, put a little bit of, uh, add a little bit of material in there because I like this suit. Just make it a little bit bigger for me. If you, if you see, if you lost some weight, you wouldn't throw that $500 suit away. Of course you wouldn't. You'd take it to a tailor and say, listen, take this in a little bit for me, please. Make some alterations because I like this suit. Well, your belief, your honor, your virtue, your love of Jesus Christ, your attachment to God, your worship, your truthfulness, and your dedication to Almighty God, you don't change that and throw it away. You hold on to that, but you make alterations where you know that the truth has been revealed to you. That's all. Then you just have to be honest enough to know that you have lost some weight and you need to make some adjustments. Islam is simple, my brothers. Bear witness that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God. If I ask any of you to bear witness that your father is your father, how many of you would say yes? My father is my father. My son is my son. My wife is my wife. I am who I am then how is it that you hesitate to bear witness that Almighty God is one and Almighty God is the only and Almighty God is your Lord and your Creator? Why? Are you arrogant? Are you vainglorious? Do you possess something that God doesn't possess? Do you have some secret that you want to share with us? Or are you confused? That's the question you have to ask yourself. If you thought that you would die tonight and that in front of you was paradise and in back of you was hellfire and you had the chance to put things straight with your conscience and to put things straight with God and to ask God to accept the best of your deeds if you had the chance to do that before you died and you thought that you would die tonight you would not hesitate to bear witness that there is only one God you would not hesitate to bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God and representative of all the prophets. You would not hesitate to bear witness that you are one of those who would like to be written down in the book of God as those who submit. You would not hesitate, but you think you're going to live a little while and you want to enjoy some things. You want to drink a little bit more scotch. You want to lay down with a few more girls. You want to wear a few more fancy suits. You want to dance a little bit more. You want to sing a little bit more. You want to hang out a little bit more. And of course, you're not ready to pray every day. That's because you think you're going to live a while. But how much is a while? I see some of you, like me, is becoming bald. How much is a little while? How long ago was it when you had a full head of hair? Some of you get gray, I see. How long ago was it when it was all black? You got aches and pains in your knees and your elbows and other places. How long ago was it when you was just a child running and playing without a chair? How long ago was it? It was yesterday. Yes. And you're going to die tomorrow. So how long do you want to wait? Islam is to bear witness that Almighty God is God, the only God, the only one without any partners. Islam is to acknowledge the existence of the angels who were sent with the, du with the duty of revealing the, the, the revelation to the prophets, carrying the message to the prophets, controlling the winds and the mountains and the oceans, and taking the life of those who God has ordered to die. Acknowledging that all the prophets and messengers of Almighty God were righteous men, and they were all sent by Almighty God, acknowledging the fact that there will be a final day of judgment for all creatures, acknowledging that all good and evil has been proportioned by Almighty God, acknowledging that there will definitely be a resurrection after death. The fundamental duties incumbent upon every Muslim is simple, five things. Islam is like a big house. And every house has to be built with pillars and the foundation. Pillars and the foundation. And you have to build a house with rules. The pillars are the rules. 
And when you build your house, you must follow the rules. The five rules of Islam is one, to uphold the code of strict monotheism, not to accept any partners with God, not to worship anything along with God, not to say anything about God that you have no right to say, not to say he has a father, a son, a daughter, a mother, a uncle, a aunt, a board of trustees, or anybody he has to ask or to say anything about God that you have no right to say. To bear witness, and you sentence yourself. You take the sentence that you want. You sentence yourself to peace and paradise, or you sentence yourself to confusion, frustration, and hellfire and punishment. You sentence yourself. You ask yourself, do I bear witness that there is only one God? And if you ask yourself that question, you say, yes, I bear witness. Do I witness that if Muhammad is who has been explained that he is the messenger of Almighty God? Yes, I do bear witness. If you bear witness to that, then all of you and all of us are Muslims. Muslims. And you don't have to change what you were. You just have to make alterations in what you were in your thinking and practice. In finality, brothers, I ask you, honest and direct question. How many of you understood what I said to you? How many of you? Just raise your hand that you understood. How many understood? How many of you, how many of you disagree with what I said? About God, about Muhammad, about the creation of life. How many disagree essentially with what I said? Okay, all of those who agree with what I said, raise your hand. Say, I bear witness that there is only one God. I bear witness that there is only one God. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. I mean, I mean, I mean. Okay. May Allah bless us. May Allah help us. May Allah guide us. And I would say to all of you brothers that you were very honest. You were very patient, but don't leave this gathering like a plate of food and just leave it. No, take this plate of food tonight. When we take our break, you sit down with a Muslim and let him explain a little further to you the prescription of Islam. Take the next step, that is, wash your hands before you eat. Wash yourself before formally becoming a Muslim. Accept Islam, know about Islam, practice Islam, and enjoy the bounties that Allah has bestowed upon you because faith is not something you can take for granted. If you don't put it into practice, you lose it like a fragrance. May Allah guide us, may Allah help us, and I appreciate the honor of being able to make a presentation to you tonight. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Appropriate at this time uh, to open the floor for some questions. And uh, in spite of the fact that, generally speaking, almost everyone here unanimously accepted the basic tenets of Islam, still, for clarification purposes, uh, ask any questions that you want, as, as brothers. Don't feel intimidated or that you're not your language or, or you have to be knowledgeable. No, ask any question. In fact, the most silly questions are the best ones. So any question that you have, ask. Brother, you presented the good style of creation. You presented to us. Go ahead, brother, speak. We can hear you. Uh, you presented to us in this fashion. The good side of creation. And uh, I didn't hear from you the bad side of creation, which is uh, on the side of Iblis. They did not touch that topic tonight. Well, you see, brother, when you go to a doctor and the doctor asks you, how do you feel? Isn't it, isn't it? He asks you, how do you feel? He said, we touched upon the good aspects of life. What about the evil aspect? The influence of the devil. Huh. So the doctor, based upon how you relate, how you feel, then he examines you. And he tries to determine by his examination a prognosis for your symptoms, and he tries to come up with a diagnosis 
of what is bothering you. Then he prescribes some medicine for you. He doesn't explain to you the, the complete background of that malady that you are suffering from. He says, take these pills twice a day, get yourself some rest, and you'll be okay. Doesn't he? If you follow that advice, you don't need to know the germs or the bacteria or the whole prognosis there. This is the doctor to know that. But if you want to know about the devil, the influence of the devil, all you got to do is flip the coin over. Whatever God tells you to do, this is good. Whatever he tells you not to do, this is evil. You don't have to investigate the evil to know it. All you got to do is believe in Almighty God because he knows better than you. If he tells you not to do something, there is a reason. And even if you don't know the reason, if you believe in God and trust in God, you do what he says to do, and you abstain from what he says not to do. And you don't need to find out the reasons. You don't need to know or get too close to the devil or the evil to investigate it, to know about it. It's all around you. God says don't fornicate. You see the effects of fornication? He says don't drink. You see the effects of drinking? He says don't lie. You see the effects of lying? He says don't kill. You see the effects of that? He says don't fornicate. You see the uh, venereal disease? He says don't do this, don't do that. You see the effect of it. We don't need to go into any great detail about it, I don't think. If they say to you, don't drive fast on the road, and then you're driving on the road and you see two cars that are smashed up like this here, you wonder to yourself what happened to the people that were in those cars, right? You don't have to investigate it to understand why they told you not to drive fast. So I say to you, brother, this. Keep in your heart the commitment to be pure, to be clean, to be good, to be upright. Then you will protect yourself from the evil. You will not absolve yourself from it, but you'll protect yourself from it. And if you yourself are affected by it, Almighty God will give you the formula and the means to change that. Huh? To change that, to make the adjustment to that, or to change yourself, or to improve yourself, and to meet the challenge of the evil. That's, that's as much as I'd like to say. And through your reading of the Quran, following the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah peace upon him, and looking at the world in general, I think you can get a, a very concise picture of evil. Any other questions, brothers? Yes, brother. I got no question, but uh, I'd like to say a few words. That, uh, tonight, I'm very fortunate. I'd like to be here. Because this is one of the, uh, the best uh, lectures I've ever heard about Islam. And... Uh, I think it was Allah who pushed me to be here. And I just arrived from Balad when a, a Saudi was going to fetch us and he said, convincing us to go, uh, to go with him. And he said, okay, we will go, but we were not able to convince the, uh, a lot of the people in our area and we were only four came over here and I said, Alhamdulillah, we are very fortunate because the subject was well explained and clarified and it's in all were accepted by our heart that there is only, and I view witness that there is only one God. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, brother. All praises for Allah, and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is Allah who inspires us to the good. And uh, may Allah reward all of us. Uh, I'm not speaking um, of my own accord. Uh, I'm speaking to improve myself as a Muslim. And this is how what we have to understand that as a Muslim, you look in the face of the other people and you see yourself and you're talking to yourself. And if what you're saying to yourself, if you believe it, then you have no problem in conveying it. And I ask Allah to improve me as a Muslim. If it does not affect another person, I ask him to improve me as a person and as a Muslim. Hello, and thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation and would like to take just a few minutes to briefly explain some final points. You see, Islam isn't complicated. In fact, the basic principles can be summed up very easily. One creator. We believe in one God. We prefer the Arabic word for God, Allah. Allah means the one who created everything. He's completely unique in his attributes and characteristics. 
infallible, indivisible, limitless, self-subsisting, omniscient, omnipotent, most compassionate, all-knowing. There's nothing comparable to him. He does not need rest, food, children, air, anything. One creation. Literally everything other than God, the stars, oceans, wind, animals, angels, humans, etc. All of these are bound by time, space, and energy for which they depend on God. All things were created only to worship the Creator. Thus, the worship of any aspect of creation is the only unforgivable sin. One way of life. Peace only results from submission to the will of the Creator and obedience to His commands. This is the fundamental teaching of all the prophets and the divine books. Worship is the practical application of belief and is necessary for success, but doesn't require a separation from religious and secular facets of life. One judgment, the last day, when every man and woman will be held accountable for each of their actions before the ultimate judge, God. One destiny, the successful ones are the righteous and the sincere believers. Their reward is eternal happiness and unimaginable bliss in paradise. The hellfire is the abode of punishment prepared by God for the unbelievers, polytheists, and the hypocrites. One creator, one creation, one way of life, one judgment, and one destiny. If you have any questions, comments, or for more information, please contact the person who gave you this tape or call the number written on it. But don't wait. Take the step that will assure your success in this life and in the next. Say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah that I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except for Allah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger to all of mankind from Allah. We pray that Allah guides all of us to the truth and keeps us on the right path. He is the most merciful. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of creation. And may his peace and blessings be on the Prophet Muhammad and all of those who follow the path of righteousness till the last day. Thank you again. Goodbye.